فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا دا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم The Usuliyun, the scholars of Usul al-Fiqh, they gave a lot of importance to the Prophet's actions. The reason why they did is because what did we say that Usul al-Fiqh's chapters deal with? What did I say that it deals with? The first one I said is Muqaddimah, right? It talks about Ahkam al-Taklifiyah and Ahkam al-Wad'iyah. Ahkam al-Taklifiyah, we said it is what? Al-Ijab, Wal-Najb, Wal-Tahreem, Wal-Karaha. والإباحة. Then we said the second thing that it deals with is what الوضعية, right? أحكام الوضعية. And we said it is what السبب, الشرط, مانع. And then we said الفساد الصحيح أم الباطل الصحيح. Then we said the second chapter that deals with أصول الفقه was what أدلة, evidences. And we divided the أدلة into two. How many types? The first one which was أدلة أصلية, and the second one was أدلة فرعية أدلة الأصلية ويسري زال الكتاب والسنة والإجماع أنا أدلة فرعية ويسري وزوات القياس قول الصحابي استصحاب سد الذريعة ها المصالح المرسلة and the likes of this so within the evidences was what the أصلية what was it الكتاب والسنة so the سنة what's the definition of it ما أضيف إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من قول أو فعل أو تقرير أو صفة خلقية أو خلقية. Are you with me, brothers? So we say when we define the words سنة, we say it's the prophet's speech, the prophet's actions, and the prophet's consent. Ali says what he consented to, and also the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's manners and the way he carried himself and the way he looked. All of those are what it's a سنة. So within that was what أفعل the prophet's actions. The prophet's actions is a سنة, and it is one of the أدلة الشرعية. So we need to know a bit about it. So that's why he brought it here. Does that make sense, brothers? So we're kind of going back to the adilla al-asliya, the original evidences. So that's why he's bringing this to us, us, brothers. And as you all know, the Messenger sallallahu job was to convey. That's what he was doing. He sallallahu is what? He is the one who's conveying the sharia. His job was balag, to convey, alayhi salatu salam. So he's the conveyor on behalf of the Sharia to us. He's conveying the Sharia to us. So the scholars, they gave a lot of importance to it. What does the Prophet's actions do feel? Uh, what does it do? What is its ruling? How should we deal with the Prophet's actions? So the author, Rahimahullah, he divides it into two types. The author here, when he talks about the Prophet's actions, he divided it into two. The first one is, the first type, is ما كان مفعولا that which has been done على غير وجه القربة والطاعة. The author he divided the prophet's actions into two. The first is that which the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did, and he didn't do it out of getting close to Allah by it. He just did it. He wasn't trying to get closer to Allah by doing it. It wasn't done على وجه القربة والطاعة. The prophet didn't do it to get closer to Allah, and he wasn't doing it to obey Allah. And the second one is ما كان مفعولا على وجه القربة والطاعة. And the second one is that which he did alayhi salatu wasalam, trying to get closer to Allah by it and trying to obey Allah in it. So let's define what the word qurba means first and let's define what the word ta'a means so it doesn't happen that we are all on different understandings of what these words mean. It's important. Qurba means it is it's a term used for anything that you worship Allah and the intent in why you're doing it is so you can get closer to Him. That's qurb. Ta'a on the other hand is a term that's used and when somebody does something is when somebody does something in obedience to Allah he's obeying Allah is Allah commanded you to do it and he's doing it okay I'm going to do it so one is that you're obeying Allah and the other one is that you're getting closer to him okay and as you can see they both kind of mean the same okay is that whatever you do to obey Allah, that you're doing it to get closer to Allah, generally speaking. So let's go back to the first of the two types of the Prophet's actions that the author is talking about. The first one was what? Whatever the Prophet did, but not trying to get closer to Allah by it. And he wasn't doing it in obedience to Allah. And that's when the author says, فَيُحْمَلُ عَلَى الْإِبَاحَةِ فِي حَقِّهِ وَحَقِّنَا The ruling for this is what? 
that it's mubah for the Prophet and it's mubah for us. Does that make sense? So take this on board, brothers. The actions of the Prophet wasallam that has not got the intention of qurbah and ta'a is of two types. Pay attention to this, it's important. The actions of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam that is khali min al qurbati wa ta'a that is absent and is stripped from obedience and getting closer to Allah is of two types. One is af'al which are called jibilli. It is actions that the Messenger did out of his basic natural self. This is just he himself was like this. Allah created him like this. Because the word jibili means whatever Allah wa ta'ala innately built in you. Like the Prophet is eating. That's jibili. He ate because it was jibili. Like the Prophet is sleeping. That's natural. Everybody does that. The drinking. These are called af'al jibiliya. The asal is that this is mubah. The second one is. Are you with me, brothers? But remember the eating and the drinking, even though it's jibili, the hay'ah, the form that you eat, not the eating in and within itself, but the form in which you eat, a hukum is connected to this. This is not normal now. Are you with me, brothers? Like you're eating with your right and not your left. This form of eating is what the hukum is connected to, not the eating itself. Are you with me, brothers? Okay. The second one is af'alul adat. The actions that the Prophet did out of customs, his custom and his people that he was from, this is their custom. Are you with me, brothers? Both of those types are mubah. It's mubah. It's what the adat means, what the Prophet did in his culture. It's mubah. Like the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to let his hair grow. That's his culture. Are you with me, brothers? Huh? Sometimes the mubah can it become makruh? Are you there? It can. It can even be haram at times. Sah? For example, he's eating. Uh, is, what's eating? Huh? Eating is mubah, right? We just took it, right? Eating is mubah. What about if a person is about to die? It becomes wajib now, you have to eat, brother. But right now, for me to say it's wajib, get up and go eat, it's not. But you're on your deathbed and you don't want to eat. No, I'm never going to eat. It's, you have to. And this action moves from ibaha now to hurma. It's haram what you're doing. And it's wajib upon you to stand up and eat. Does that make sense, brothers? If you're in a culture, with letting your hair grow. Are you there? Letting your hair grow. You're in a culture where homosexuality is high. Dress, making letting your hair grow like a female is haram. Are you with me, brothers? Or you're in a community and a people like our community, Somali community. If you let your hair grow, it's like you become Iyala Sukh. You're a street boy, gangster, wanna be, huh? Especially if you wanna plait your hair. Yeah. Is it called K-Rones? Huh? It's a sunnah, the Prophet used to do that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes. See, some brothers are getting happy. No, you can't do it. Because Al-Adab al the custom doesn't allow us. Our custom is disrespect for you to do it. Are you with me, brothers? The custom is that you need to, you have to honor the custom that you're from. If it's going to lead to people gossiping, backbiting you, looking down at you, and it's going to lead to something harmful, then it becomes obligatory for you to adhere to it. Are you with me? And the underlining definition, Ibn, uh, Ibn Atiyah, when it came to the ayah, when it came to the ayah, وَأَمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ When it came to that ayah, he says that the urf مَعْمُونٌ بِهِ إِذَا ورد, That the urf is implemented as long as there is not, that it doesn't oppose the sharia. 
So this, just insulting people's cultures, that's jahl. Because the culture, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it doesn't do mu'arada of the nusus. Are you with me? We Somalis, it's our culture to eat banana with uh, rice and chicken. It's our culture, right? Have you guys ever tried it? You guys need to repent to Allah, man. <laughs> yeah? Hamza, you tried it? You have never tried rice with the banana? Who's Somali here who hasn't, who, who's Somali who hasn't done it? Exactly. Exactly. We will start questioning your Somalianism. <laughs> so, yeah, brothers. Who's not Somali who's tried it? Hey, who else? Allahu Akbar. Could always give you a, a visa. Could always enter in. The culture is ma'mul, it's respected, and it's, as long as it doesn't do mu'arada of the nusus, it doesn't go about against the textual evidence. The second type of actions of the Prophet the author talks about is that which is done out of qurb. The Prophet is trying to get close to Allah by it. And he's also doing it out of obedience. This is divided into two. The first one is Evidences have shown that this is specific to him. Evidences have shown that it's specific to what? That it's specific to him. And this is what the scholars called Khasa'isun Nabawiyyah. They write books on this. Things that are specific to him. Like only the Prophet ﷺ could marry what? Nine wives, right? Can, we, can somebody now today get married to nine wives? What about if he says to you, Allah says Mathna, which is two. Wa thulatha, which is, makes it five. Wa ruba' that makes it four. Yeah? So I can marry nine now. Mathna. Thulatha Warruba' Isn't that nine? Does somebody say that? Yeah? Huh? The Arabs don't say Mathna and they mean two like this and then Thulath they mean three like this They say Thalatha They would have said Ithnain Thalatha, and they'll say Arba'ah. Does that make sense? But when they said Mathna two, wa thulatha, it means what? It means three independent from the two. It doesn't, it doesn't connect itself to the two. Sah? Wa ruba'ah, when they say it, it means four, in the, not mentioned with the previous numbers. By itself, four. The person who says that and adds it up like that is min al ujmi utu. It's because he doesn't know the Arabic language. That's where the problem came to him from. The second one is <coughs> that which evidences haven't shown. It, is, it doesn't show that this is specific to the Prophet. And that's where the author, Rahimahullah, he says, You're not allowed to spe specify this for him. There's no evidence that shows. So the Prophet did this to get closer to Allah. He did this out of obedience of Allah. And there is no evidence that we have today that shows that it's specific to him. Are you with me brothers? For example, that is a male teaching females without a veil. Did the Prophet do it? Was he getting closer to Allah by doing it? Yes he was. He would teach like that. So for a person to say, no this is specific to the evidence, this is specific to the Prophet, Bring us evidence. Are you with me? Are you with me, brothers? It needs? Bring us evidence and proof. We'll take it. Because this falls under the Qawluhu Ta'ala لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا And it's not only that Abu Bakr did it and Umar did it after that, so it's permissible. Are you with me? Especially in this society, and now it is, it's better to not teach. I mean, better, it's better, naam. Is it better? We, that is a discussion that can be open. And is it seen? Naam. But to say it's haram to teach them, is a, it needs a dalil. That's what we, the issue we're talking about here right now is hurma, hurma. Are you with me, brothers? 
This qa'ida memorized this. Which is, the things that are made haram are two types. Are you with me? Something that's haram in and within itself. It's haram in and within itself. Drinking alcohol is a haram in and within itself. In order for that thing to become halal, necessity is needed. What's needed? Barura is needed. Are you with me, brothers? You have to be in a state of serious and the Barura's definition is something we need to look at else, elsewhere. We'll study inshallah in ta'ala and qawa'id al fiqhiyah today. The second thing that's haram is that which that which is not haram in and within itself. It is haram based on what it will lead to. Are you there? Example for that is looking at a woman. Looking at a woman is not haram in and within itself. It's haram based on what it will lead to. And that's why when the man wants to get married, the woman he wasn't allowed to look at before, he's now allowed to look at her. Because now it's going to lead to what? Something that the Sharia likes. Are you with me? When he goes to a shop and he wants to buy something, is he allowed to look at her? Huh? That's where, that's where the scholars say, something that's not haram in and within itself is made permissible, not, not for darura, haja. If there's just a need for it. It doesn't have to re even reach in the darura. Because to marry a woman, does it need, is a darura? Not darura. It's a haja. It's a haja. So what in, when it's not haram in and within itself, are you there brothers? When it's not haram in and within itself, haja would allow it. But when it's haram in and within itself, to get it, to use it or to have it, you need what? Barura. Does that make sense? Necessity. It has to reach necessity. Are you with me brothers? So the issue of teaching women are, it falls under that which is not haram in and within itself. It is ma hurri ma li dhari'ah. It was made haram to block off a haram, it's going to lead you to. Are you with me? Huh? 